It's lovely to be here, and it's great to have another opportunity to celebrate um, Hazel's wonderful book, Imperial Intimacies. I'll introduce the panelists, and um, Hazel Carby declined to send me a proper bio, so <laughs> <laughs> I assume that um, if she wants me to say something else, then reading her you know, accolades and accomplishments. So the first person I will introduce is Dixa Ramirez de Olio, is an assistant professor of English and American Studies at Brown University. Her first book, Colonial Phantoms, Belonging and Refusal in the Dominican Americas from the 19th Century to the Present, was published by New York University Press in 2018. She's in the midst of manifesting her second book, I love that language, Blackness in the Hills, Horror and the Photographic Negative. Um, should I introduce my good friend Tina? She needs no introduction, <laughs> but uh, Tina Camp is a professor here in modern culture and media. She's a feminist theorist. She has published many books, including Other Germans, Black Germans in the Politics of Race, Gender, and Memory in the Third Reich, Image Matters, Archive, Photography in the African Diaspora, and Listening to Images. Her new book, The Black Gaze, will be published by MIT Press in 2021. Brian Meeks is a professor and chair of Africana Studies at Brown University. He is the author of 12 books and edited collections, including Critical Interventions in Caribbean Politics and Theory, Caribbean Revolutions and Revolutionary Theory, An Assessment of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Grenada. Narratives of Resistance, Jamaica, Trinidad, the Caribbean, and Envisioning Caribbean Futures, Jamaican Perspectives. His novel, Paint the Town Red, was published in 2003, and his volumes of poems, The Ku Klux Clicks, was published in 2018. Um, Deborah Thomas is the R.G. Brownlee Professor of Anthropology and the director of the Center for Experimental Ethnography at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the author of Political Life in the Wake of the Plantation, Sovereignty, Witnessing, Repair. Um, also the author of Exceptional Violence, Embodied Citizenship in Transnational Jamaica, and Modern Blackness, Nationalism, and Globalization, and the Politics of Culture in Jamaica. And she is co-editor of the volume Globalization and Race. Um, and I just want to uh, say a few things about um, Hazel Carby's wonderful imperial intimacies. And for those of you who don't know, although I think hardly anyone doesn't know, Hazel Carby was my teacher as with an undergraduate and then again as a graduate student. So Hazel Carby has left her mark on me. Um, imperial intimacies is a history of empire, slavery, colonialism, and migration written in the form of a memoir. This eloquent and moving account of the entanglements of empire is narrated from the perspective of a young black girl of Welsh and Jamaican descent trying to survive in post-war Britain, a world that would prefer for her not to exist at all and that never for a moment fails to see her as an outsider, an eternal alien. Where are you from is the question that each day challenges her right to belong that routinely marks her as a foreigner in the country in which she was born. The narrative advances on dual tracks and the story oscillates between the girl and the eye of the adult narrator, a scholar and researcher in search of the pieces of her past and reckoning with what it means to be black and British. Stories shared in the kitchen and recollected from the sick bed compete with the archive regarding the truth of what has happened when. At every turn, Carby refuses to tell a tidy or convenient story and instead produces an account of empire that is as expansive as it is heartbreaking. I use the word heartbreak in a manner consistent with the effective landscape detailed by Carby. Imperial Intimacies is a book that eschews sentimentalism, but heartbreak does convey the psychic consequences dealt to those who dare defy the commands and prohibitions against interracial intimacy and promiscuous sociality. 
families who trouble and cross racial lines rather than secure and police them. What Carby offers us in imperial intimacies is not an interracial romance about the triumph of love, but a firsthand account of the price paid and the damage done to a young Welsh woman, Irish, and a Jamaican man, Carl, and their children, a family who live at odds with and in defiance of the norm. As Catherine McKittrick and Alexander Wehalia write, heartbreak captures at least a little those injuriously <coughs> loving emulations of what it means to be black and human within the context of white supremacy. Heartbreak works with and in excess of the bio-mythological heart, that hollow muscular organ and its narratives of effectively variegated tenderness and loss. Heartbreak represents the reverberating echoes of our collective plantocratic historical past and the present. Heartbreak elucidates how the violence of racial capitalism inaccurately reproduces black life. Heartbreak burst apart. It is one of the things that I love most about imperial intimacies, the way in which it excavates the intimate and psychic landscape of structural racism and colonial violence. The forces of capital and the racial logics that define and determine the social relations of empire are explicated, but in a manner that conveys their emotional weight and power. We are forced to contend with the lived dimensions of social and historical violence. Imperial intimacy offers a richly, a richly textured one centuries long history of heartbreak. This is what makes the book more than a memoir, but an auto theory of imperial formation narrated on the register of subject making and its impossibility. Thank you. Let's welcome the panel. Good afternoon. So, um, the book actually goes backwards. It opens in post-World War II London. It goes all the way back to Jamaica in the uh, 18th century. But I'm just going to read from a very small part of it today. Let me tell you, does anybody know what you're looking at? In 1815, the British government decided that they were going to count every enslaved person in their empire around the world. This was actually put into practice by 1817. And what you're actually looking at is a slave register for 1817 for Jamaica. Um, and I don't know, can you see the small writing on the top? Can you see who the owner is? Yeah, Lily Carby. Okay. So let me just read a little. The section I'm going to read from you starts uh, with one, it's entitled Writing by Hand. My father has, or more accurately used to have, beautiful handwriting. The headmistress at my secondary school, a Miss Pym, prized the art of penmanship and would have considered his writing, his handwriting, exemplary. Before dementia began its relentless encroachment through his mind, before an autoimmune disease wrought havoc on his muscular system, my father wrote lengthy, thoughtful, and carefully composed letters to me and mailed them across the Atlantic. He was a man who was reserved and yet quick to anger. When he wanted to express emotion, affection, or explain a deeply held belief, my father wrote it down. For over time, he had become fearful of misspeaking. The act of putting pen to paper, of shaping individual letters into words in solitude, of making many drafts of a letter before being satisfied with it, allowed my father to say exactly what he meant. Every day, Miss Pym wore a tightly buttoned suit jacket and pencil skirt and secured her steely gray hair in a knot at the nape of her neck. 
She had a ramrod straight back and a stern demeanour. Miss Pym was a woman of convictions, one of them being that the content of my character did not reside in the colour of my skin or my mongrel background. Another was that one's future was not determined by the social status of one's parents. I loved Miss Pym without reservation, even though she could be very aloof, and her grave frown of disapproval made me a little afraid of her. She took her responsibilities as headmistress very seriously. For some reason, she believed that I, one of the few day pupils on a scholarship, a gangly almost teenager who ran when she should have walked and who was accused of having her head in the clouds, had the potential to become, in her opinion, an accomplished woman. Among the accomplishments that Miss Pym was determined I should acquire was the art of the English round hand. Penmanship, Miss Pym declared, reveals qualities of character. I considered her dictum. Recipients of correspondence in an elegant hand judged the writer as a person of confidence and worth. I concluded that this was true. My mind was not so much in the clouds as saturated with the fictions of the 19th century English novel. I was a young woman possessed by Jane Austen, Anthony Trollope, and George Eliot. From these fictional worlds of country houses and estates, I gathered that after breakfast, gracious and elegant women retired to a morning room to deal with their correspondence. Correspondence was among the words I savoured, rolling it around in my mouth, tasting it. Miss Pym solicited information about my background. But it seemed to me the more I revealed, the greater was her conviction that my handwriting was paramount to announcing my worth to the world. Hunched over my school desk or dining room table, fantasizing that I was sitting gracefully at a desk in a morning room, I raised my treasured silver and turquoise Parker pen over the page of my exercise book, bottle of ink and blotting paper in close proximity. I took a deep breath, determined <coughs> to wield the pen to my advantage. Yet endless hours of patient practice produced unruly results. Evidence, I suppose, that a beautiful hand is not an inherited trait. I disappointed Miss Pym, my father and myself, eventually settling for a readable, functional, inelegant scrawl. More than 50 years later, I still have my pen, but it lies ignored in the velvet confines of its original box usurped by a laptop computer. Sitting at my table in the National Archives at Kew, I remember what Miss Pym used to say about handwriting and British character. I am scrutinizing a document, hoping it will reveal the character of the man who wrote it, this document. My finger slowly traces the fluid but faint lines of ink originally penned 200 years or more ago in Jamaica, broad, flowing upward and downward strokes that with the slightest movement of the wrist become whisper thin, curve, then end in a graceful, controlled flourish. As I work my way down each column on the copy of a copy, of a page numbered 37, the act of tracing triggers body memory. Wrist, hand and fingers 
anticipating the changing angle of the pen tip as it captures letters and words and phrases in measured elliptical black shapes, evenly spaced and inclined at an angle of 55 degrees. I recognised the English round hand that I tried to make my own. My father's writing always appeared controlled and deliberate. I never knew him to make a careless stroke. His letters left the impression of precision, constancy, careful consideration and exactitude of meaning. Is this what is meant by character? My ageing hand, with its wrinkles, bulging veins and encroaching rheumatism, abruptly stops moving down the page. I can feel my child's hand grasping the barrel of a pen tighter and tighter in a fruitless attempt to prevent its wayward ramblings, random deposits of blots, nib skittering off the page, gouges in its wake. When my father raised a pen as an adult and began to write, did he remember learning how to form his letters in a Jamaican classroom between 1925 and 1927? In a letter, he once told me the story of how he learned to write. My grandmother Rose paid for my father to attend a local nursery school between the ages of four and six years old. It was very small, just eight to ten pupils, and run by two English sisters, referred to as the Mrs. Lopez. My father's natural inclination was to pick up a pen with his left hand, but the Mrs. Lopez not only believed in the early inculcation of the values of the British Empire, they considered his left-handedness an intolerable, un-English perversity a sin deserving a sound whipping. They insisted, his letter read, that I wrote with my right hand, so when I was caught using my left to write, I had to place my hand on the desk only to be lashed with a 12-inch ruler or a cane. I had to go home with my left hand swollen and in pain. I could not complain to anyone. Is each N dash in his letter an act of extraction or exclusion? In the spaces between words lie the memory of punishment. In the first, a conflicted hesitation, an anticipation of pain, a reluctance to place the hand which had been rapidly hidden between thighs when footsteps approached back on the desk. In the second, a young black child's agony and anxiety, slow te steps on the path toward a home without a sympathetic ear, with each attempt to suppress a sob, a swallowing of the bitter taste of injustice. I do not know how often my father must have picked up his pen with his left hand, despite instructions to the contrary, but it must have been many, many times Assiduously, deliberately, systematically, the Mrs. Lopez instilled character into this black male child, teaching him to conform to their wishes, to conform to the order of the classroom, to conform to the British order of things by beating his left hand with a cane. Daily beatings, crushed and broke, the knuckles of each and every finger of his hand as they lay spread-eagled on a blood-soaked desk. It was when my father picked up a pen with his right hand as an adult that he glanced at the deformed knuckles of his left hand and told me this story for the first time. Did his hand ache with memory? Is this why he made such circumspect, studied and deliberate movements when he wrote? My dad learnt his lesson. His English round was perfect. The art of English round hand is a conduit through which 
multiple histories and geographies flow. It was taught to my father in Jamaica and to me in England more than 30 years later. In the same hand, accounts of empire were produced in meticulous detail by its ambassadors, clerks, bookkeepers, lawyers, merchants, planters, and traders in enslaved human beings. As academics, we sit in archives and we stare at these records and registers and ledgers and lists, each carefully rendered in measured and elegant script. The terror and the violence is camouflaged by this cosmetic beauty. Acts of gracious writing that account for empire are evidence of the bottomless depths of unacknowledged violence and brutality embodied in British character and values across the colonial and the imperial landscape. As I held my father's letters, I could feel the imprint of his deformed fingers steadying the paper as he lifted his pen to write to me. My father told me, we come from Portland, from Skibo, near the Swift River. In the summers, I would leave Kingston with my grandmother and go to Portland, and nearly everyone in that place had the name Carby. I followed my father's voice to the 1817 registered of the enslaved on the Carby plantation in the parish of Portland, Jamaica, stored in the records of Her Majesty's Treasury. It seemed replete with information, lists of assigned names, allocations of color codes, and ages approximate, uh, approximated, but I knew it could not tell me where we came from. <coughs> Empire is accounting, continuous and rigorous accounting. The technologies and the techniques of imperial governance were wielded by its bureaucrats in myriad colonial offices and in the metropole. Scriveners created order from disorder with pen and ink, purging the subterfuge and the insurgency of the enslaved from their account books. Clerks concealed horror within the gracious lettering of English calligraphy. Bookkeepers invented and maintained an imperial fiction of order when they rendered the turmoil and the violence of plantation existence into regimented rows and columns with headings and subheadings. Accountants transposed people into profits and losses in their ledgers as they whipped them into shape as numbers. Colonial officers erased black life from their correspondence. Slave registers produce a particular way of seeing, presenting a regime of truth that governs visibility. The politics of this arithmetic is not only about rendering invisible the humanity of those listed, but also about rendering what is visible within particular frames. Writing within the confines of these registers and plantation records is an <coughs> act intended to submit the enslaved to the use of those who wield the pen. Pen 
and ink and paper, hands copying and reinscribing relations of domination and subordination, the orderly columns and the headings and the lists belie the disorder of field, plantation, estate, house, and bedroom. Slave registers purport to be a rational, measured form of accounting. But in the face of the unreasoning and arbitrary violence that governed the plantation, they are a symptom of imperial insanity. It's an honor and privilege to be here with Sadia Hartman, Tina Camp, both of whose work I deeply respect. My colleague at Brown Dixer, who every time I see her, I say, we need to talk, but <laughs> <laughs> haven't talked much. Here we are. My colleague in Caribbean studies and friend from long time, Deborah Thomas, and most of all with Hazel Kabi, whose work I have admired from a distance, and whose new book we are all gathered here today to, to celebrate and critique. Let me begin by saying that imperial intimacy is a remarkable accomplishment, managing in compact fashion to weave together an intensely personal and convincing autobiographical historical narrative with a novel and convincing comparative and longitudinal meditation on race and racing across two nodal points in the network of the Black Atlantic, Jamaica and the United Kingdom. And a profoundly feminist story on how women, her ancestors, forged strategies of survival despite the overwhelming odds and injustices of capitalism and slavery. All of this is done alongside a timely and sharply corrective conversation on the truly insidious nature and meaning of empire and of the British Empire, to be more precise. On the one hand, then, this is a daughter's story and what it meant to be mixed race and specifically to be the child of a black father and a white mother in post-World War II Britain. It is not just a ubiquitous repetition of the question throughout her childhood. Where are you from? Directed possibly at her racially ambivalent half-caste designation. But the structural violence visited on her father with the relentless exclusion of his racialized self from the job market. The figurative and literal slamming of doors in the face of her parents, depriving them of the right of living together the violence that this structural racism engendered in their lives, and ultimately, how this tore them apart individually and as a family. Kabi, however, with this riveting narrative, is only at the beginning of her tale. I can't and don't mean to try and fail to tell it in 10 minutes, except to say that the careful sifting of archives, maps, family memories, gravestones and photographs, takes us from rural English poverty to laundresses in Bath, train engineers in Bristol, on to true hunger, hunger in Potter's Row outside the General Penitentiary in East Kingston, coal miners' families suffering from TB in Wales, to marginal banana growers striving to make ends meet in Swift River, Portland, Jamaica, and finally, to the sleepy village of Colby in Lincolnshire, where a discovered revelation serves to connect some of the dots, of which more and on, but of course cannot bring an end to a story which still continues. On the way, Hazel presents us with a master, or more appropriately, mistress class, on the historical and continually evolving nature of racing. For as she so appropriately asserts, race is not unknown, but a verb. Racism, Stuart Hall has argued, and she agrees, did not begin with the post-World War II arrival of black West Indians, West Indians on H.M. Windrush, but is deeply embedded in the very fabric of empire. Thus, 
long before actual encounters with black people, the poorest white British understood that they were citizens of empire and therefore, despite unimaginable poverty, inherently superior. This certainty, reinforced by centuries of myth-making, was already an implacable ideological wall by the time the first trickle of soldiers, like Hazel's father and airman, began to arrive, followed by the much larger immigration from the Windrush and beyond. Her significant accomplishment, however, is to move beyond this terrain to look at the other side of the equation and how racing developed its own unique and peculiar routines of violence and subordination in her father's island of Jamaica. Because African genealogical, genealogical chains were broken in the horror of the transatlantic trade, it is through the name Kabi, and this she amply illustrated a while ago, that she is at first able to make historical connections. From the village of Colby in Lincolnshire, Lily Kabi and his two brothers became soldiers and were billeted to Jamaica during the French Revolutionary Wars. Being white, Kabi, who owned nothing before, acquired land and slaves after leaving the military and eventually became a coffee farmer in Portland, where he raped enslaved African women, had children, some of whom bore his name, and among them, the ancestors of Carl and, of course, Hazel Kabi. Here, of course, the story becomes complicated in a Jamaican fashion. Some of these brown descendants inherited not only the name, but land. A fair complexion and property allowed them to marry up. Some Carbys therefore became white, while others remained black, leading Professor Michael Thelwell of blessed memory to ask the young Hazel, are you from the white or black Carbys? And indeed, when Hazel in her research visits the matriarch of the Carbys in Portland and notices that she looked just like her late aunt, she is told after retelling her convincing story that no, her side of the family was not related because in effect, they were too black to be family. Lest we consider this comedic, we should remember that historically and indeed today, in venues like Jamaica, life chances and prospects are still intimately connected to skin tone, hair texture, and accent. Ironically, his notes that even her father's ability to get ahead in Jamaica, to attend technical school, and even be accepted as an airman in training to serve in the war, may have been influenced by the fact that in her words, he was coffee colored and not dark brown. Penultimately, on the question of empire, the antidote to any nostalgic reminiscence on the glories of empire, whether from half-cocked Brexiteers on the right or a variety of historically obscurantist perspectives on the left, is to be found in the portrait of imperial brutality as so carefully drawn by Carby. For while she adumbrates the history of overt violence and massacres captured, for instance, in the 1865 Morant Bay Rebellion, in which the governor, Ayer, massacred more than 400 black people in retaliation to a handful of white deaths, it is in the everyday structural violence of exclusion and hunger that the fullest story of, British, of the British Empire is to be told. The enclosure of the commons as a prelude to the production of cheap and desperate white labor. The hard scrabble existence of her laundress ancestor in the city of Bath is particularly vivid. And at the heart of her story, the capture, rape, and prolonged effort to dehumanize black people from Guinea, the Bight, and the Congo, Congo kingdoms, and the articulated continuation of this in the poverty and desperation of 1930s Jamaica is finely painted as prelude to outward migration as the only means of escape and survival, but also paradoxically as captured in the persistent belief in empire and the willingness to fight and die for it as the ultimate insidious violence of imperial conditioning. I end my brief intervention with Hazel's final poignant pages. Lily Carby's parents were married at the All Saints Church in Colby, Lincolnshire. Lily, as previously noted, 
through service in imperial wars and via the mechanics of race and capitalism, ends up as a slave owner in Jamaica. One and a half centuries later, one of his descendants and that of the enslaved African woman, Nancy, who through rape bore his children, becomes an airman in the Royal Air Force's Bomber Command, fighting for the survival of the empire against Nazi Germany. He is stationed at RAF Waddington, adjacent to Colby. Carl Carby, as he told his daughter in his keen memories of the war years, remembered All Saints Church because its distinct gleaming spire would be the guide that indicated that on returning from a dangerous bombing run over Germany, he was safe. He had returned home. The cruel ironies embedded in this intimate narrative of return, of race, and of nation are subtle but profound and capture in miniature the richness and perfection of Kabi's unforgettable book. My comments are a conversation. I tend to write in dialogues. So what I want to do is um, read you passages for those of you who haven't read the book and then pose a bunch of questions and refle reflections. So I'm going to start with this passage. Sorry. I'm aware that my narrative is suspect that it projects my own desires back onto the figure of a grandmother I would, not, I would have wanted to know. I resurrect Beatrice from the darkness of my mother's rage to unravel and find different meanings in her stories. If I can reweave the warp and weft of her ambition, an, ambitious, uh, an ambition Beatrice nurtured in furious resentment of the orthodox customs and conventions of class, and gender that ruled the place and time in which she lived, she can become the poet who never wrote a word. She writes as a child of empire, an instantiation of its imperial intimacies. She writes as an errant daughter who located herself in photographs and rewrites her family's stories to retrieve a different kind of sense from the remains. She dares to inhabit the tense of the subjunctive and to write in the interrogatory. She is a storyteller who retells the stories of a suspect narrative. Moving fluidly between genres of writing usually kept separate, Imperial intimacies entangles the history of empire with the histories of two families that crisscross the Atlantic in ways that intersect and eventually knotted in tense, tender, and volatile ways. Memory interweaves with history to complicate and enliven the official record, to challenge both what we know and how we know it, and to jostle and juxtapose whose truth holds sway and why. I am a student of memory, and I am a student of the many devices, of its many devices. I call myself a student because learning about memory is an ongoing and unfinished practice. I learned tremendously through the memory devices Carby makes such masterful uses of in imperial intimacies. I've evoked a few of them in my opening litany of multiple positions and perspectives that Harvey adopts, Harvey, Harvey, <laughs> Carby, I wrote Harvey, uh, Carby <laughs> adopts in composing this remarkable work. In the spirit of a dialogue with someone who I know is an equally avid student of memory, I'd like to pose a few questions in an attempt to suck the rest of you into the swirl of our shared preoccupation. Another piece. The girl always wanted to hear more about the characters who populated her mother's stories. She would interrupt and pepper Iris, Iris with questions about who they were, what they did, and whether they should carry the label of great uncle or aunt, or as her mother was only a child, whether they were a cousin once, twice, or thrice removed. But the girl's relatives appeared only to stage the life of her mother. 
They had no script, no substance of their own. Iris's real purpose in telling these stories was not to explain family relations, but to talk about herself. In her 80s, my, mother's was, my mother was physically weak and frail, but her will to dominate everyone around her had strengthened. Iris clung tenaciously to her image of herself as a woman who had suffered through life and deserved reparation. I shuttled to and fro from across the Atlantic to be greeted by the same stories she had told um, the girl throughout childhood and teenage years. Some passages were reproduced word for word, but the adaptations, the new versions of what was being said, carried new conclusions, which seared as intensely as when the girl first heard them. I came to disbelieve my mother's stories and considered them self-serving. I orphaned myself to cling to my desk and books. My final act of defiance as my mother's errant daughter is to rewrite her stories to retrieve a different kind of sense from the remains. This begins by reconstructing the life of Iris's mother, Beatrice. In this passage, you describe what you call your boldest acts of defiance as an errant daughter, to rewrite her stories to retrieve a different sense of the remains. What does it mean to write the intimate secrets of your family to yourself, to your family on both sides of the Atlantic, and the academic disciplines that shaped you? This book is about the retelling, about retelling history from the vantage point of the linkages and connections empires sought to disavow or erase. Those erasures and disavowals were histories that, as you write, taught both sides of your family to be white in different but deeply intertwined ways. You and I have discussed the book at many stages of your writing of it, and most recently just after its publication. But since then, I'm wondering about the kind of receptions that you've encountered as a result of these retellings. retellings. What have been some of the responses, I'm just deeply curious, <laughs> that you've received to the practices of refusal you manifest in this book? A refusal to stay silent, to respect the historical status quo, to write an authoritative voice or ma of mastery or truth? What is the response to your constructions of suspect narratives and practices of speculative fiction and critical fabulation you engage in among the many disciplines you are in conversation with? Historians, literary criticism, uh, cultural studies, but also the conversations you're in with non-academic audiences on both sides of the Atlantic. I am also an equally passionate student of photography and visual culture, and someone captivated by what images allow us to say and do. So it weighs on me as similar to Hazel, a girl who located herself in photographs, is the role photography and images play in the book as a, as a kind of portal into history. The photos and images she includes in the book are both a challenge to and tool of memory. They don't just illustrate, they contest and multiply the narratives of race, class, and empire she tells through her family history. In the conversation that will follow, <laughs> I would love to hear your thoughts about the multi-layered role and function of images and photography in the book. And then I wanna just read one more tidbit. <laughs> I try to imagine the relationship between Mary Ivy and Lily on the Lincoln Plantation and speculate that for Mary Ivy it must have been a life of careful negotiation. I expect she asked herself what Lily was thinking when he stared at her with his gray eyes as if he was assessing and questioning her motives without saying a word. Could Lily ever trust, fully trust any of the black and brown people around him? Even if he wanted to comfort himself with the thought that he was obeyed because he was respected, if not loved, at other times he must have recognized fear, hatred, and desire for revenge in the eyes that looked at him, even in those of Mary Ivy, who must have felt resentment at Lily's lack of regard for her precarious legal standing. If Mary Ivy gazed steadily back at Lily, as he was the first to turn away, was, I'm sorry, at Lily, was he the first to turn away? Because he did not want to know what she was thinking, did not want to acknowledge that she might have a mind of her own, did not want to see that she was afraid of him. 
I have to end with a recognition and a realization. The audacity of writing in the subjunctive and the interrogatory is a courageous move that I have learned and emulated in your work for a while now. I realize that the subjunctive and the interrogatory is another practice of refusal in your work. It is a refusal to look away from the erasures and foreclosures of history. It is an acknowledgement that we must confront the fact that they too have a logic of their own and that what is revealed when we actively engage them may frighten us to our core. The subjunctive is an engagement with what might have been that opens the door to what has become. The interrogatory is taking a step into querying our place in these complicated histories and taking up a position within them. I am intensely grateful for the courage you have given us all to partake so boldly in an equally important practice of refusal. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I would like to thank Tina for uh, inviting me to be part of this incredible event. Um, and also thank you to Hazel for sharing your work with all of us. Um, I'm glad to see Hazel. I was her colleague at Yale and she was a mentor to me while I was there. So this is an incredible honor and a treat. In the logic of empire, everything and everyone must be in their proper place. But even under minimal consideration, the logic of empire begins to fall apart. In Imperial Intimacies, Hazel Carby painstakingly demonstrates how this is the case, noting the loose threads in the supposedly tightly woven fabric that is British identity, as evident from her wanderings in archives all over Britain and Jamaica. As with other nationalisms, this logic of everyone in their place extended into the home. Carby memorably describes the supposed convenience of newfangled washing machines, meant to replace the day-long toil of housewives. The girl, writes Carby, despised the washing machines. It was a barrier. It denied access to the back door, to the gooseberry bushes and the earwigs that lived between the roots, to the pear tree in blossom at the bottom of the garden next to the gate, to an exit from suffocating domesticity, end quote. This is an exemplary passage of the book's accordion-like movements between the domestic and the imperial, and also between the far past, at times as far back as the ninth century, uh, and present day Carby on her visits to various villages of the British Empire in both Jamaica and Britain. While the little girl's brother enjoys her beloved outdoors with his friends and the father plays cricket, mother and daughter toil away in the kitchen to maintain the upkeep of the domestic sphere. Zooming out, Carby describes in painstaking detail all the ways in which her father's wartime efforts in support of the British would not only go uncelebrated but actively denied. The very idea that a Jamaican man would have been in the Royal Air Force during World War II denigrated. In the myriad examples that Carby provides her of her father attempting to receive the proper compensation for his military service to the nation and acknowledgement of his British citizenship, I see the attempts to find another outcome to the logics of empire, which are, of course, not logical at all. Logic, uh, logic and evidence are only ruses, and imperial centers created entire branches of study to help ensure that everything and everyone remain in their proper place. After the war, schools in England drilled into children the lesson that they were to heroize the men who fought in the war with special attention given to members of the elite Royal Air Force. When Carby, as a little girl, factually shared her own father's story of having been part of the Royal Air Force, the teacher's response was neither logical nor truthful, but it was consonant with the truth and logic of empire. The teacher retorted that, quote, colored people were not British, but immigrants who arrived on these shores after the war had been fought and won, end quote. In this statement, the teacher provided a young Carby with an important lesson, which was that when you were a normative white subject of empire, you can quite simply create the truth you want to see, and which protects your own inclusion. In this statement, the teacher had excised Carby's father's service to the British military because he was colored. At the same time, the teacher had erased British reliance on its colonies in the Caribbean and beyond. 
In this way, the teacher ensures that both she and her colored pupil both fulfill the roles in maintaining the whole. She instills the truth and logic of empire, which need not be based in any fact whatsoever, and the little girl must repress her own understanding of the world, which what she knows and feels to be true. For the teacher to acknowledge that the Royal Air Force included people from places like Jamaica would have been to acknowledge in some small way the history of British colonialism and how she in some way benefited from this history. It would also be to acknowledge that many white British people who have never left the British Isles might have black relatives in places like Jamaica and Antigua. That relationality, I mentioned Antigua for a reason, that relationality <laughs> must be denied because true relationality is the enemy of hierarchy. Writing about genetic studies that, quote, attempt to define the people of the British Isles, Carby asserts that what these studies cannot even begin to imagine, what lies outside of their parameters of investigation, that in these stable English villages, people had black, brown, and white grandchildren, enslaved and free, in the Isles of the West Indies, end quote. People, for instance, like Carby's own ancestors. For the child in the Caribbean, perhaps one of those black relatives, the inverse is true. Per perhaps it is not the case any longer, and I would like to hear from people who have been uh, raised in Jamaica very recently. But for children of many generations after emancipation in the early 19th century, not a day can go could go by when he or she could not think of England, English people, English flora, English fauna, English everything, against which he or she will never compare favorably. Lucy, the titular character of Jamaica Kincaid's novel about a young Antiguan woman who moves to New York City, recalls being chased by daffodils, that is, by empire. I remember an old poem I had been made to memorize when I was 10 years old and a pupil at Queen Victoria Girls School, Lucy narrates. I had been made to memorize it, verse after verse, and then had recited the whole poem to an auditorium full of parents, teachers, and fellow pupils. After I was done, everybody stood up and applauded with enthusiasm, an enthusiasm that surprised me. And later they told me how nicely I had pronounced every word, how I had placed just the right amount of, a, of special emphasis in places where that was needed, and how proud the poet, now long dead, would have been to hear his words ringing out of my mouth. I was then at the height of my two-facedness. That is, outside I seemed one way, inside I was another. Inside, outside false, inside true. And so I made pleasant little noises that showed both modesty and appreciation. But inside, I was making a vow to erase from my mind, line by line, every word of that poem. The night after I had recited the poem, I dreamt continuously, it seemed, that I was being chased down a narrow cobbled street by bunches and bunches of those same daffodils <laughs> that I had vowed to forget. And when finally I fell down from exhaustion, they all piled on top of me until I was buried deep underneath them and was never seen again. <laughs> I love Jamaica King. <laughs> uh, end quote. Considering this logic and truth of empire, which creates value systems around the most minute forms of difference, it is no wonder that Carby finds some comfort in that which resists being categorized and placed into hierarchies. Against proverbial daffodils, Carby asks us to consider lichens, or lichens, I, saw, I heard that they were pronounced both ways. Uh, I will close with, wor with her words about these unruly creaturely things. Having been repelled by the rigid classification systems of, of slave registration, it was a relief to turn to an alternative world of observation, where words of approximation dominated the language of identification ish qualified color definitions, whitish, grayish, grayish, greenish gray, bluish green, reddish, reddish brown, the recurrence of or linked oppositions, simple or sparingly branched, tubular or solid, erect or decumbent, colorless or dark colored, on the grounds or on walls, <laughs> and the adverbs sometimes and variously appeared frequently, and a little bit later she writes, with lichens at least the poetic qualities of inexactitude remain, capturing the challenges and possibilities of categorization 
with language that is elastic and pliable, expanding and bending to reach its truths, providing clarity without sacrificing complexity or detail. Thinking about lichen is liberating as well as instructive in a world in which taxonomies, genealogies, and the singularity of lineages, ancestry, and origins dominate, circumscribe, and limit definitions of humanity. Lichen contain ecosystems, as do humans. We are interconnected, interdependent multitudes." End quote. And I'll finish there. <laughs> Curriculum is different. So. Is it? Okay, <laughs> <good>. <laughs> okay hello everybody. Um, there's a moment early on in Hazel Carby's Imperial Intimacies when she writes about the ways her mother Iris, as a Welsh woman, refused Englishness but embraced Britishness. The discussion centers around her mother's disappointment that Empire Day, the 24th of May, was becoming an occasion to protest imperialism rather than to celebrate the sun's inability to set on the many territories around the world that constituted Britain's colonial possessions. Dismayed that Hazel and her brother did not seem to attach to the values and ethics of Britishness, she began to recite Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. In the book, Hazel reproduces the lines, if you can keep your head while all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. And as I read, I completed the stanza she left unfinished in my head, having heard my own father recite if a million times before. My father was born about a generation after Hazel's parents in a small corner of rural Jamaica. For him, if constituted true north, the compass for standing firm in a difficult world, perhaps especially after he traveled to the United States to go to school, which is where he met and married my mother. A bound copy of the poem still sits in his dressing wardrobe, and he, he read it at my wedding reception, thus reproducing empire in the midst of the <laughs> intimate gathering of family and friends, only some of whom would have recognized it as the imperialist screed it was meant to be. My father, like Hazel's mother, recognized themselves in Kipling's words, even though my father was not the poem's intended audience. Or was he? I couldn't help laughing out loud about reproducing this moment of imperial connection across generations, time, and space. But of course, this is the point of imperial intimacies. Hazel asks for these moments of recognition and connection with her readers by reading archives through family stories and vice versa. Her assertion that, quote, Britishness harbors the deepest interconnections of class and race and gender urges us to think anew about how we become imperial and colonial subjects. She wants us to wonder about the intimate effects of empire, the ways we are imbricated within and shaped through historical processes we cannot always name, even as we are experiencing them in our day-to-day -day lives. She shows us what happens when we encounter ourselves in the archives, and she encourages us to interrogate the forms of consciousness this encounter might make possible or shut down. What does imperial intimacies teach us? Formally, it tells us about the circuits linking rural Britain and rural Jamaica. It reminds us that the black presence in Britain did not begin with the arrival of the Empire Windrush in 1948, and that the racial logics that sustain Britain's system of race and class were forged through centuries of expropriation overseas. Affectively, it poignantly teaches us about the silences not only of written archives, but of the omissions and occlusions within family stories, about how looking back never really takes us home. Perhaps more than many of us, Hazel is able to encounter traces of her family in the records of the Colonial Office, at the British National Archives, and in the other archives she scoured. Birth records in Bristol and Cardiff help her trace her maternal line's living conditions just before and during the growth of industry in Somerset in the early 19th century, leading her to imagine how her grandmother, despite her own poverty, was conscripted into inhabiting imperial subjecthood and the modernity offered by 19th century Bristol. <laughs> 
Hazel reminds us that this modernity was only possible because of the trade in slaves and because of the labor of enslaved persons cultivating on sugar, tobacco, and chocolate plantations in the West Indies. Hazel's father appears in the archives at Kew in a file that covers 23 years of his life, beginning when he applied for an educational scholarship to the Colonial Department's Welfare Office in 1946. This was a time when the Colonial Office imagined that former soldiers like her father, as colonial subjects, would leave England after the war and return to wherever they came from. Hazel herself received mention in her father's file as a baby in the womb, when reference was made to his wife in the Colonial Office's decision to grant Carl the scholarship and thus the ability to temporarily stay on. This concession was granted, however, with the stipulation that after his education was complete, he would be on the first ship out, an order that was later rescinded in the manner of colonial administrative whim, one of those inconsistencies produced by the tension between assessing individual promise and standing by racist policy. Hazel's paternal line also appears in the Portland Parish Register of Plantations in Jamaica's National Archives, and thus she is able to trace the 18th century origin and journey of Lily Carby, a British man who traveled from England to Jamaica to, be, to become part of the plantation order near Swift River. This originated the white Carbys in Jamaica and eventually also the black ones, as Brian pointed out. Juxtaposing these documents, cold, filed, organized against the embodied experiences of anger, betrayal, madness, frustration, and disappointment gives context for family dynamics without drawing a straight line between the two. Throughout imperial intimacies, we follow Hazel's father, whose bid to escape the depersonalizing poverty of downtown Kingston led him to become among the first to volunteer for the Royal Air Force at the beginning of World War II, the racism prevented him from serving until 1942. Her father was part of a group of colonial soldiers, she tells us, who were later obscured in the imperial education she herself received in rural Britain after their demobilization. We learn of Carl's frustration with the British immigration officer's inability to accept his Britishness after Jamaica's independence in 1962, despite the evidence of Carl's previous passport and his wartime service record sent to him by the Air Force itself. Turned away by Great Britain, we watch as Carl is forced to apply for a Jamaican passport through the Jamaica High, High Commission, a passport he had never wanted, and then we walk alongside him as he attempts over decades to regain his British citizenship, which at the age of 83, he was finally officially granted. We learn of Hazel's mother's search for independence after her mother's death, her work as a domestic servant, and her subsequent attempt to attain middle-class respectability through civil service during the war. We witness her first meeting of Carl at a social event for the RAF servicemen, and we watch her leave her village to give birth. We see her refuse to acknowledge her child as colored, a living threat to the existing racial order, and thus we also see her refuse to reconfigure her own whiteness in the face of the historical shifts of which she was a part and to which she was contributing. We come to understand the various post-war disruptions of the fiction of white Britain and the various discriminations faced by white women with brown babies and of black men always positioned outside the social and political body. We read of the couple's inability to find solace and acceptance or to move beyond their outcast status, even in London. And we learn of the pressure this created on their union. Throughout, we feel the agonizing poignancy of both of Hazel's parents longing to realize the promise they felt during the war. And we feel their slow realization that despite imagining that after the war, their union and their offspring would be part of the British culture, they instead were understood as a contagion that had to be contained and negated. Hazel revisits the Kingston home in Raytown where her father was born, as well as the various locations in Devon and Somerset where her mother, grandmother, and she herself began life, everywhere feeling like an intruder, missing the recognition of place or family that might legitimate her existence. In a 2009 essay, Hazel laid out the analytic parameters of what would ultimately become imperial intimacies, 
She wrote of her focus on the geopolitics of encounters rather than the linearity of temporality and of her attention to, quote, avoid the pitfalls of binary thinking, the polarities of opposition and difference that have dominated historical narratives of the workings of empire and its subjects, polarities which have not only maintained but also reproduced inequities of knowledge and power. Instead, she continued, I've been thinking about both the particularities and the commonalities in experience and history across and within the colonial boundaries of empire that Manichaean divisions and hierarchies of supposed racial difference cannot acknowledge. These divisions and hierarchies unearthed ghosts, hauntings that took years, decades, to find and assemble. Bringing ghosts to life requires a good deal of imagination, for sure, but this imagination is a terrorizing task. As much as we want to know the past, to understand how people became accustomed to thinking of others as property, objects, things to inherit or sell, to unearth people's efforts to refuse these designations, this desire creates a particularly painful affective condition and conditioning. Reckoning with the past is perhaps easier done in the abstract. Confronting these ghosts through an excavation of one's own family line is quite another thing. The gift of imperial intimacies, therefore, is this. It's a daughter's excavation of individuals' attempts to create spaces within which they might realize themselves as humans and actualize their aspirations in relation to the imperial technologies and racial logics that were themselves nimble enough to simultaneously accommodate and thwart them. Imperial intimacies also offers us a political gift in a moment that sometimes seems theoretically dominated by a theorization of anti-blackness rooted in Afro-pessimism. By outlining the intimacies of two islands at particular historical junctures, Hazel reminds us that it is relational social theory rather than identitarian essentialism that gives us our most profound insights into processes of racialization and therefore into the specific interventions that might be taken to refuse, rework, and undo them. I think we're, t we're ready to take questions um, if we, or responses or comments. And there's a mic, and there's another mic. <laughs> Hi. Um, I had a, a kind of question for the panel as a whole. I also want to ask you this idea, but, but she's sitting over here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's a chair for her up here. Yeah, I'll ask you this idea's, this idea's nameplate. But Deborah, in your talk, you mentioned Rudyard Kipling, and, and I remembered this line that I can't remember, I don't know where it comes from, but he wrote that no one knew it was the truth until someone told a story. No one. Rudyard Kipling wrote this, this line, no one knew it was the truth until someone told a story. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that, that, that quote comes from, but I read it when I was in school, and it stuck with me ever since. And... I was thinking about that in relationship to a term that Tina used at the beginning of the event about critical fabulation, mm -hmm. and thinking about that document that was floating up on the screen for a while there. And I guess I'd want to ask how each of you think about narrative mm -hmm. in relationship to the violence of the document, and, mm -hmm. and how this book perhaps engages in the problems of dealing with assessing existences that don't fall within the bounds of the register, but that were there all along. I mean, in a way, uh, you know, one of the ways I could respond to you is to say, yes, <laughs> that's, exactly, that's, ex that's exactly the point. That's the challenge, if you like, facing us. Um, we are overwhelmed on the one hand um, by the question of archival knowledge, as if archival knowledge 
is sufficient evidentiary the truth. Um, and, and part of the whole project is to completely dissect that um, as, as, a, as a fiction. Although my work doing that brings me up against the entire British Historical Academy, <laughs> um, up against, in general, uh, the practices of the, of the discipline um, of history. There's a, thinking about refusals, there's a, an absolute refusal that this could possibly be history, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think also if we think, I mean, the 18th century was actually, you know, emerged as being really important um, for, my, for my project. Um, you know, many historians have sort of seen that as the moment when um, a sort of, you know, a notion of Britain, Britishness is formed, although, of course, that's imagined as a combination of somehow, you know, Wales and Scotland and, and England in the 18th century. Um, what's happening outside in the empire not being thought to be part of that, just remaining as other. And yet, right at the centre of the 18th century are all these black voices. There are all these um, black narratives, black people writing in the context not just of um, the movement to abolish the, the slave trade, um, but offering extremely sort of complex, but also fragmented notions of what Britishness is, um, which belie any sort of sense that this is a cohesive category. So even someone, for example, like Equiano, um, made the claim in the 18th century to, to holding together multiple forms of the meaning of Britishness, holding together however contradictory that may be, holding together the sense that, um, you know, he served in the, in, the, in the Royal Navy, for example. He was also enslaved. There's, there's a way in which... Um, These narratives apparently based on archival evidence, these historical narratives, attempt to give a coherence which has to be contested. But we can't, we don't have an easy coherent formula to put in its place. We have to deal with face, um, the fragmented, the, the broken. Um, there are no easy linearities in this book. I mean, the trajectory of the narrative is overwhelmingly backwards, but often it's actually it, it's moving to and fro at the same, at the same time um, to, to get back there. So... You know, these sort of the, the question of family history, the question of memoir, I'm actually even, I'm trying to disrupt that. Um, because the, the conventional understandings of those forms um, are dependent upon a fiction, imaginary, coherent subjects. <laughs> who can call themselves English or British, and apparently, or even you could think of, you know, as, as American. This is not, um, this is, it, the, the work that I'm trying to do is to reveal that the way in which not just we inhabit, but how white supremacy itself is inhabit. In, inhabited and enacted is not um, a coherent, progressive, 
linear um, framework um, that really derives from sort of some sense of, you know, the enlightenment, that there is this enlightenment singular self that, um, you know, emerges and ends up defining humanity. And the work I'm trying to do is to excavate the underside of that enlightenment and to show how incredibly, not just entangled, uh, but contorted um, and fraught um, and broken, but also intimate. Um, these stories are because of colonialism, because of, because of imperialism. And so, if you like, the order imposed on the slave register is, is just an example. I just use it as an example um, of one of the many ways in which, you know, order is, a, whether it's a question of a a unitary subject, uh, whether it's the question of a sort of racialized being or whatever, how this order is imposed um, on turmoil, um, on total insanity. And I don't, I don't, I could, I couldn't do that in a, and somehow maintain the fiction that you could do this in a cohesive narrative. So I'm constantly forcing the reader to have perhaps leave some passages with more questions than she began with when she started, thinking that a reader knows where this passage or paragraph or section may be going and making sure they do not actually go there. So it's, it's, um, it, it's, that, it's that constant disturbing I think, of, of expectations, which tries to ask a question about how we are all, how we have all been conscripted, inscripted um, into these, um, you know, apparently cohesive, apparently hegemonic, well, they are hegemonic, but full of contradictory um, ideologies um, and practices. And you know, si silences. Um, I wrote actually. I, I wrote a piece which isn't, which isn't in the book, because um, the editor didn't like it. She <laughs> thought it was. Uh, but it's actually it's about sitting in the national archives, and it's about confronting the classification system, and thinking about what it actually means when you want to research the question of enslavement. Um, and the records of, of, of the British Empire, you actually have to enter through the records of the treasuries. I talk a, in great detail um, about the classification system. So you are forced, to cut a long story short, to look for property. So even though you may be going back to the 18th century, you have to enact, you have to live relive, reimpose on your quote-unquote subject that you're searching for, the fact that they are property. So it goes through the Department of the Tre Treasury and then the Compensation Commission. And the ultimate absurdity of that, where it's actually the slave owners who are compensated. So I, I sort of pose the question of, you know, supposing this was actually these records were classified under a very different label, like crimes against humanity, how would that? <laughs> so, so it's just, it's, it's trying to pull together that sort of sense of how we're f we, are b we have to relive, reenact these inscriptions at, 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 every, at every stage. Um, does that? It doesn't actually answer the question about critical fabulation, but you know a lot of that is to do with what. So, what do you do with the silences? How can you imagine into those silences? But I also think that what you do, there is a how to that, which is the 
inhabiting the the subjunctive and the interrogatory, right? Yeah. So asking the question of, you know, to pose particular questions that are also about, you know, inhabiting the conditional that might change. Um, but that's what I've modeled for, from your work. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, is this on? Okay. Yes, it is. Um, thank you for that beautiful talk and also beautiful answer. Um, actually, going off of that answer, I wanted to ask about this idea of the intimate um, and the idea of having to reenact a violence as it relates to care. Because I was wondering how one approaches an enormous project like this with care for subjects that you can't necessarily speak for or speak to in particular ways, mm. with care for subjects that you might be distant from because of place, because of time, um, because of lack of knowing, and how one approaches like care for those subjects in trying to construct something like this when looking back. And there were, there were multiple strategies, um, but <coughs> if I could just give you, um, you know, one example. So I'm dealing with a lot of archival material of all sorts. Um, census records. Um, I pay a, a lot of attention to place. Mm. So I think um, a lot, you know, a lot about the, uh, through the maps of the period, I walk the places, by the way, every single one of them. Mm. Um, and insurance records. For example, so in um, in Bath, when I'm actually talking about my great great grandmother Re Rebecca, I had. And this is for every section. There's all this apparent information. It's a bit like the slave register. It appears to be replete from in, in, in. and so I try. I tried very hard to reconstruct what you cannot what a census record cannot possibly give you um, and what it must have been like. I mean, that I obviously rely on an ex extensive histories that people have written about what it was, you know, the, the work of being a laundress and all the rest of it. But what it was actually like um, to be, you know, laundering... Um, the very personal intimate, this is just one of the ways I use intimate, um, garments and linens of people who were incredibly wealthy and, you know, Bath was a place where a lot of people were actually getting their wealth from plantations. But what it was like to then be moving through a city... Um, at night, what it felt like after that labour, and I sort of described the labour, because I think we, we need to restore this sense of, 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 of the day and the labour. But then also what it was like to actually um, pass from the incredibly wealthy area in that job into the poorest part um, of the city, because these... Ex the inequities of empire are reproduced within British cities, not just in terms of the metropolitan and its mm. exterior. Um, but also, you know, what could... I mean, I could find through census records, I could find through maps, I could find for insurance maps, but I could recreate what it, what it must have been like to live next to a slaughterhouse, what the smells, you know, the taste, what, what a how a census record could not actually <coughs> tell you um, what it was like to care for a child in the middle of the night who was hungry and you had nothing to give or who was sick and whatever. So the care is what I felt I, I owed these people to sort of... Re and I do the same, you know, in, in Jamaica. The care is what I felt... Um, I owed people who's, who were intimately linked to each other across empire, but whose, whose stories were not available to us, who, um, 
you know, who, who lived and died in poverty, one thinking that they were actually superior to the other, whatever. Um, but who... I, and I was, the other thing I should say is because, you know, the history of enslavement in Jamaica has been so... is predominantly told through the question of the sugar barons, right? So the story in terms of the UK is then, these were aristocrats, and it's just, you know, it's the people in the big houses. It's not, it's not everybody. So the other, the other aspect of, of care is to actually pay great attention to how to ordinary people actually um, were completely caught up in this, in this empire. Um, how someone who was actually, you know, from a poor family in Lincolnshire gets into the... I mean, the care was in the, the sort of real attention to trying to bring these stories um, to other ordinary people in a very accessible way, um, pulling upon all the sort of theoretical um, insights I've had over a, a career um, and, 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 you know, and being a black feminist. Um, but in a way that I could actually reach ordinary readers to bring it home to them that they were implicated in these, in these stories. Um, I make it very difficult for, pe for readers to sort of just dismiss them out of hand. But. We've got time for one more question. Sorry, am I going on to? No, you're just. <laughs> Do you guys want to say something? No. <laughs> Hi. Um, I know this, I'm assuming this book is quite new, but I'm wondering what your, the reception has been at home. Um, just like thinking about uh, Dick's earlier, you said um, the illogical nature, the logic of, of imperialism is very illogical, but like it's held. <laughs> in Britain in, in a way that is very specific. And so, um, and also the kind of discussions that we have about, about empire, about race, about the UK's um, central place in that. It, it's not, those aren't the kind of things that I was learning at school in the UK. So I'm wondering what, what have you anticipated about the reception at home to this book and, and what have you received? Well, it was launched in the UK. Mm -hmm in various different venues. And so the small, um, the venues were basically, um, you know, the local black population came out were completely different to the sort of, you know, academic venues, if you like. Um, and what, what would happen was that, um, I know, local communities, it was really interesting actually because younger generations would come and bring older people from their street mm -hmm. or their neighbourhood or whatever. Not necessarily loaded, not necessarily mums <laughs> and grandmothers, but just there was a way in which the younger generation felt they needed to get out an older generation mm -hmm. to hear, you know, some of this stuff. And, and so that um, prompted an awful lot of um, family, other family stories, mm -hmm. you could say. But I mean, people just started... Um, talking and one of the things um, growing up um, in the UK is that our Caribbean parents didn't tell us an awful lot about them and it was amazing how many stories actually were sort of being generated in front of me in response to to this so that was that was really interesting um, in general, the establishment of just sort of pretending it never happened, I think. The book was never, I don't know. There's, there, there is apparently a, a review coming in the London Review of Books, but who knows um, what, what the response will be. But certainly, you know, I have no, um, I'm under no illusions that it's going to change the Nile Ferguson's of this world or whatever, or, or that it's really ever going to. Um, really challenge in, in any real way to get people to think about um, the incredible melancholia for empire at the moment, of which Brexit is just one. Um, 
It's just one instance, if you like. Um, and, you know, the Simon Sharmas and Nile Ferguson's, of that, I mean, they have, they have the story of empire so tied up in the popular realm, too. They're the ones who do all the BBC t TV series and something. So, you know, the people who um, engage with me are the sort of, you know, the black radicals through The Guardian and stuff like that. Um, you know. So, but on the other hand, I, there was a, there was a, the official launch was actually at the British Library. And that was quite extraordinary because, you know, all the sort of, the black British of all sorts of, you know, the, I don't know, intelligentsia, cultural work as well, that sort of thing, turned out. And that was really, that was a lot, that was a lot of fun. Um, and then there was just one moment when I was in Bristol, and I have, I had, I didn't know what to say to this. So, um, this white woman came up to me, and I thought I recognised her face, but I couldn't sort of really totally place it. And then she announced who she was, and it was one of the children in a, uh, the white children in the neighbourhood where I grew up, mm -hmm. and she came to issue an apology for the way the kids for the way they all behaved to me i don't know and it was it was very much like i didn't understand i didn't you know whatever and that was sort of silence thing really i didn't quite know what to say to her um, so i don't know the, the the reception here is 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 different i think because you know People don't necessarily, I mean, you know, I'm surrounded by people who do think these things and about settler colonialism and all that sort of thing. But um, in general, I don't think African-American studies as a field really, um, I think at the moment it's overwhelmed with its own sort of you know, national concern with national boundaries. Um, and so I'm just like another upstart in a way like I always was, you know, I don't know, like all these arguments about why are black British, you know, uh, playing these films, you know, playing, getting roles in films of Americans and <laughs> all that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I've always, I've always sort of felt uneasy in that, you know, that somehow I was taking up, the, you know, an academic position of, that should really go to a real African-American and all those sort of authentic things or whatever. So it, it's among those I think with there's there's one sort of reception and among Caribbeanists or those of Caribbean history of, of sort of heritage there's one but then I think the the main African American establishment I haven't got a clue what they think of it frankly <laughs> I really haven't very yeah. very quiet. Well, some of us know what we think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you establishment? Well, uh, since when were you the establishment? Oh, really? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know I was an establishment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the negative sense. Oh, okay. But on that note, I'm going to actually thank all the panelists and thank all of them. Uh, for all of them.